السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Good evening everyone in UAE time. I welcome everyone and all of you uh, and thank you for attending this session. Uh, one of the sessions for neuromuscular series which we are doing from uh, the uh, end of last year. Our talk today will be focused on Maestrino Gravis and would have a flavor of uh, young and expert doctors here. And today, uh, the talk or the meeting will be chaired by Dr. Salama Karmsteji, who's a specialist neurologist in Rashid Hospital, DHA, and she is our future neuromuscular specialist. Uh, Dr. Salama, uh, please go ahead and... Uh, I'm Dr. Sam Karmstegi. I'm pleased to have you all here this evening to join us uh, my senior graders uh, webinar. Uh, we are grateful for our speakers today that will be able to, show, uh, to share trusted and evidence-based uh, information on my senior graders. Today's uh, webinar will be about uh, update and diagnosis uh, of my senior graders will be given by Dr. Yasser and uh, treat, uh, update and treatment of my senior graders which will be uh, done by, Dr. by Prof. James uh, Howard. Uh, in advance of their presentation, I would like to thank each and every speaker to their time and uh, expertise. Um, uh, before we start, I would like to mention that we have muted all participants, but I will come to type any question or comment for uh, today's session and the Q&A answer. We have a little time at the end of today's webinar for uh, question and answers. Uh, first, we have Dr. Yasser Malik, a senior specialist in Rashid Hospital. Dr. Yasser graduated at uh, King Edward Medical University, and he uh, and did his neurology board from College of Physician and Surgeon in 2011. Welcome, Dr. Yasser. Uh, my main talk would be about the myasthenia gravis, its diagnosis, uh, diagnostics. Uh, myasthenia gravis is basically a post-synaptic antibody-mediated T-cell dependent immunological disease. And uh, its annual incidence is approximately 7 to 23 uh, new cases per million, prevalence of approximately 70 to 320 mil, uh, per million of the population. And it has been noticed in uh, recent studies that uh, since mid 20th century, the, the incidence, the prevalence is on rise for the myasthenia gravis. I will be discussing uh, myasthenia briefly about the basics, uh, facts, and figures of myasthenia, and then I will be going towards the diagnostics. So mycenia uh, is a bimodal, uh, has a bimodal onset as you can see in this graph. Uh, it's showing the two humps. The first one is uh, in the second to third decade. And the second one is, uh, the first one is second, third decade. And the third one is the fifth, sixth and seventh decade. As, as it's evident here that the first one is more prevalent in the females and the second one is the more prevalent in the males. And that's why we see more commonly the young, uh, female patients in our clinics. So there's another form of myasthenia that is postpartum myasthenia. That is uh, probably during the pregnancy, the immunological systems have been suppressed and all of a sudden after the pregnancy is over in the postpartum, if some of the patients are having subclinical disease as the system is, uh, immunological system is, uh, it goes on search just after pregnancy though it appears uh, just after pregnancy, but it is having relatively a better prognosis. And there is a neonatal myasthenia that happens in 10 to 20 percent of neonates, especially in the in, in the neonates of the myasthenic mothers. That is because of the uh, transmission of myasthenic antibodies uh, across the center to the neonates, and it's having a relatively very good prognosis. It remits you in a few weeks. Uh, okay, so. Uh, the diagnostics would be in two parts. The first part is the clinical side, you know, the mycenia is most important thing is the history and examination and that then we'll go towards the laboratory. The most important thing is the history and examination of mycenia. Uh, mycenia patient really most of the time presents in the younger age and it is with the fatigability, ocular features like diplopia, blurring of the V and ptosis, uh, or there is some change in the voice or there's uh, chewing difficulty or fatigability that presents with this. I want to mention one thing, particularly in this weakness, uh, when the patient comes with the weakness, the weakness is really fluctuating. It's not typical, it's, it's, it's not uh, the continuous weakness that is going throughout the day, like the other neurological disorders. It is fluctuating, like it would be, 
usually in, in the morning patient would be very much normal to be having very minimal weakness but as the day passes on the weakness would increase and uh, muscle fatigue is there but unlike other fatigue syndromes it is very much focused it is specific to certain muscles especially the muscles who are doing the repetitive movements uh, it's not generalized like generalized fatigue syndromes and some and some of uh, you, you see two type of uh, myasthenia uh, in general one is uh, ocular myasthenia and second is generalized myasthenia ocular is presenting mainly with ocular features only sometimes you may see some of the atypical features with ocular myasthenia like isolated ocular nerve ocular motor nerve neuropathy intranuclear ophthalmoplegia or vertical gaze paresis you may think of something else but myasthenia should still be kept in the mind now the the patients who are presenting with the ocular myasthenia almost 50% of such patients they transform into generalized myasthenia in the uh, two years but what are the factors that can predict that this patient would go into generalized myasthenia or not that unfortunately we don't have so and uh, some particular features in the history then generalized neurological examination is important then i will uh, show you some particular signs about the myasthenia first one is the curtain sign that is uh, usually positive in the patients who are having uh, asymmetric ptosis or that is ptosis only in the one one eye like you can see in the first figure on this side uh, this lady there is significant ptosis on the left left eye and there is very minimal ptosis in the right eye so what happens that uh, in order to maintain a sustained posture of the uh, eyelid there has to be a continuous release of vestal choline to in my senic patients so there is hearing law that if there is sustained release of cholesterol and acetyl cholesterol that would affect on the normal as well as on the abnormal eye so what happens then when we hold with the hand the abnormal eye of the patient and uh, this sustained release of acetyl choline that is poured, that was supposed to spurred in this posture that goes away and as it was uh, giving some force to the normal eye or less totic eye also so that spurt is withdrawn and suddenly that goes down so you see the normal eye of the less totic eye goes down that is not curtain eye sign and there's another one that is called kogen sign in kogen sign uh, usually the patients who are having uh, neurovascular junction blockage or their transmission is somehow delayed for certain for any moment they have to accumulate a source of acetyl choline then they will uh, do some movement so when you are seeing a patient you ask the patient to look down and then to bring your eyes to the primary gaze so that acetyl choline sources which have been accumulated that will search that will act on its sudden and the patients instead of coming to the primary gaze would have overshooting of the eyes so as you can see in this panel the a is look uh, down gaze the b you can this see there is a feeling of overshooting in the right eye and then see after that the patient comes to the primary gaze so this overshooting is called coven sign uh that's all about the clinical side now we'll do uh, that's there are certain tests on the clinical sides uh, most important the easiest one is the ice pack test that is carrying the sensitivity of 80% if you put ice pack on the totic eye for almost one minute you can see there is relief of the ptosis that is probably the release of the acetyl choline that is potentiated second one is the tensilon test that is done by the adrophonium adrophonium is one of the acetyl choline strength inhibitor it's short acting and relatively safe uh, it uh, prevents the breakdown of the acetyl choline into the choline and acetate when you give that it blocks the acetyl choline strength and it uh, increases the more amount of acetyl choline that improves the tolerance of the eye or any clinical finding so every uh, adrophonium is uh, given uh, in 2 mg bouts intravenously you give for 2 mg for once then look for the response then you repeat it after every 60 minutes up to the maximum dose of the 10 mg its sensitivity is 80 to 90% and we have to be cautious about the myasthenic effects of the adrophonium especially in the elderly patient the pediatric patients who are having cardiac disease or who are having bronchial asthma because it can trigger the cardiac arrest cardiac blockage or bronchial spasm now going towards the laboratory side the, the most important thing which are commonly carried out are the autoantibodies 
So approximately 90% of the generalized myasthenia that is zero positive. The, the, the patients who are carrying either acetylcholine receptor antibodies or anti musk antibodies, these are termed to be positive. The remaining who lack them, they are considered negative. Okay, so in those who are having purely ocular myasthenia, the sensitivity of acetylcholine receptor testing is relatively low, detectable in approximately 50% of the patients. And the ocular myasthenia patients with mask antibodies are very rare. They are usually presenting, most of the time they're presenting with acetylcholine receptor antibodies. Sensitivity of antibodies varies by the type of myasthenia gallus. So especially if it is uh, generalized myasthenia, then specificity is very high for acetylcholine receptor antibodies. For the generalized antibodies, uh, for the generalized my senior gravis, acetylcholine receptor antibodies would be positive in 85% cases. Musk would be positive in the uh, 8% and LRP, that is low dense lipoprotein receptor protein 4 antibodies that are, is positive in 1% of the patients. And remaining 6% would be zero negative. So as I said before, the patients who are lacking the initial two, that the acetylcholine receptor and the musk antibodies, they are turned to be they are turned as seronegative uh, mycelium gallus. So in this picture, this is a postsynaptic terminal picture. You can see the array of the multiple molecules here. Acetylcholine receptor is the one that is anchored in the membrane with the help of repsin. So any antibody that is against the acetylcholine receptor or repsin, that would be giving the picture of mycelia that is resembling the acetylcholine receptor uh, antibody positive mycelia. And musk antibodies, they are associated with the dog anti dog. So, anti dog antibodies or anti musk antibodies, they would be giving the similar picture that of like anti musk positive anti myasthenia virus. Most of the time, it is generalized myasthenia. Very, very rarely it is ocular that is uh, carrying the musk antibodies. And the third is LRP4. There's a molecule called agrin that is uh, uh, anchored along with that. And the antibodies against uh, agrin or against LRP4, they would be giving this kind of mycenia and that would be very uh, mild form of disease. Now talking about the antibodies one by one, first of all, acetylcholine receptor antibodies. Uh, usually in the assay, we can look for three kinds of antibodies, the binding, blocking, and modulating. But the binding is most important. And most commonly commercially available antibodies are the binding antibodies. Whatever usually we are checking, that is the binding antibodies. And it's checked by the radio amino assay, and it's highly specific for mycelia gallus. The assay for the binding antibodies is most sensitive. Essentially, all the patients with mycelia gravis with thymoma are zero positive for binding acetylcholine receptor antibodies. The negative predictive value of thymoma in the absence of acetylcholine receptor is very high, it's 99.7%. The patients who are uh, don't, don't carry anti acetylcholine receptor antibodies, the thymoma, uh, the presence of thymoma is highly unlikely in these patients. Acetylcholine receptor uh, antibody titer poorly correlates with the severity of disease. So if somebody asks me that doctor, I started the patient on the uh, anti immunomodulator or anti acetylcholine receptor inhibitor, uh, and acetylcholine so stress inhibitor medication, do I need to check for the uh, level of the antibodies in order to get the response whether my patient is uh, responding to this medicine or not? So the answer is no, because these things don't uh, predict the therapeutic response. Very rarely, these antibodies can be positive in the lambert myasthenic syndrome, motor neuron disease, and polymyositis. The second one is the musk antibodies. Musk antibodies, uh, they are present in 38 to 50% of those patients who are lacking acetylcholine receptor antibodies. There are particular features about them. They can onset in any age. They're female preponderance. And there are two very important syndromic presentation of such kind of mycemia. One is ocular bulbar. They present with the diplopia, artrosis, dysarthria, and nasal twang of the vice or hoarseness of the vice, but there is no pure ocular mycelia in this. And sometimes you may really see the tongue and facial atrophy in this kind of mycelia. Second form that is really, you can see in the clinic, that is restricted myopathic pattern with a prominent respiratory or the proximal muscle weakness. 
especially the neck extensors are weak in this kind of mycelia. As anti mask antibodies are not associated with the thymic pathology, so role of thymectomy is uncertain. Ocular features are common in anti mask antibody mycelia, may be presenting feature also, but the ocular mycelia is very, very rare in this kind of uh, mycelia. Third one is LRP4 antibodies. They are part, in, part of agarin receptors required for agarin induced activation of mast and acetylcholine receptor clustering and NMG functioning. And approximately 10% of the patients who are seronegative for both acetylcholine receptor and the mast antibodies, they would be carrying such kind of antibodies. The patients who are carrying such kind of antibodies, they are relatively younger, they are more often females, and they are having milder form of disease. Uh, there appears to be no association with the thymic uh, pathology once again. So uh, uh, role of thymectomy is again uncertain here. So there are certain new kind of antibodies having some significance in some context that I would be mentioning. There's, these are called antistriatal uh, antibodies. So, uh, striated muscle antibody. This class of antibodies against component of scattered muscle, scattered muscle, they include the Titan, Ryanotin receptor antibodies, myosin antibodies, and alpha actin antibodies. They're present in 70 to 80 percent of the patients who are having myasthenia, especially the patients who are younger than 40 years. And 30 percent of those adults who have myasthenia but don't have thymoma, they would be carrying them. And 24% of the patients who are presenting with thymoma, but they don't have mycelia, they would be carrying this also. So the significance, particularly for these antibodies, are that unlike the other antibodies, these antibodies somehow can predict the clinical course of the disease. Like uh, if you ask me that if I started the patient on the treatment and I want to check the treater of the antibodies to predict the therapeutic value of these, will the patient benefit from this or not? So these antibodies somehow they can predict the uh, benefit in the future. Then there is one important and new antibody that is clustered acetylcholine receptor antibodies, also called low affinity acetylcholine receptor antibodies. These are seen in 50% of seronegative mycelic patients. They are done by special cell-based cell assay, and uh, they are useful thymoma markers especially in the younger population, they have positive predictive value for thymoma uh, of uh, 30 to 35% and very high negative predictive value for the thymoma. The new antibodies, uh, KV1.5 and agarin are under assessment and clinical relevance is known very little at the moment. Maybe in future we'll be able to get something. As I mentioned before, the patients who lack acetylcholine receptor and anti musk antibodies, they are called seronegative mycelia. They account for 6 to 12 percent of the patients. And they are having relatively milder form of disease and having better prognosis. This is the summary of whatever I said so far. The three antibodies are very important, currently commercially used. Most common one is acetylcholine receptor antibodies. They can present in two forms. The, the first one is early onset, lesser than 50. Second one is a late onset, about.